Hello and welcome from me, David Foster. Everywhere you turn these days, there is COVID. Not just the disease itself, but the bombardment of information, misinformation, concerns, deeper fears, questions about life, and naturally in these times, death. Can you keep your mind safe in such worrying times? This is Roundtable. Well, what have the last six months done to our mental health? We've been bombarded with news, a great deal of it fake. Who wouldn't worry? The potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people's mental health is of increasing global concern. The United Nations reports that higher than usual levels of symptoms of depression and anxiety have been recorded in various countries. For instance, in Amhara Regional State of Ethiopia, estimated levels of depression have tripled compared to before the pandemic. According to the UK's Office of National Statistics, the number of adults suffering depression in Britain has doubled. In Canada, the UN reports an increase in alcohol consumption as a negative mental health coping mechanism. The World Health Organization says the responsibility for action lies with governments. But at the moment, the WHO reports 40% of countries have no mental health policy, over 30% have no mental health programme, and around 25% of countries have no mental health legislation. Researchers at the UK's Brunel University say one possible solution to the downturn in mental health is meditation and a mindful outlook towards life. But are we seeing the start of a looming global mental health crisis? Very pleased to say that we can welcome to the round table Dr. Cyrus Abassian, who's a consultant psychiatrist working for both the national and private health services. He's in London. Also in London, Eleanor Antonova, senior lecturer in psychology at Brunel University of London. And Eleanor, we'll come to you in just a moment about your project Protect Mental Health, a study you've done since um, the COVID pandemic began. But Cyrus, let me come to you first of all. Fair to say that there's been a, a massive increase in the number of people you've had to treat because of their fears about what's been happening since the beginning of the year? Yes, so stress is bad for mental health. Uh, and most of us have been in, in a lot of stress uh, since the lockdown. And I've seen a, a, a lot of uh, patients who have previously been under my care relapsing uh, because of, the, because of the, the, the changes associated uh, with the lockdown that, were, that was imposed on them. And on top of that, I've had a cohort of new patients, patients without any pre-morbid conditions who have uh, developed a psychiatric condition, mainly depression and anxiety in, in context of uh, this sort of the, 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 the new normal that has been imposed on them. Without breaking patient confidentiality, what, what, what are the biggest stresses for them at the moment? The economy, the uncertainty. Uh, it's... There's, there's a correlation, very strong correlation between economic downturn uh, and mental health conditions. Uh, and, and, and right now, the furlough scheme in the UK uh, has kind of delayed, unfortunately, the in inevitable, that is economic depression. Uh, and and we, we know that when, when people don't have jobs, don't have the financial security, it's more likely to lead to mental health conditions, particularly, particularly depression and anxiety. It increases the risk of suicide as well. Uh, they're more likely to have thoughts of suicide or attempt to, to take their lives. And also there's an association with drugs and alcohol misuse, in particularly alcohol. And we've seen uh, more alcohol intake in, in the period associated with the lockdown. Alanda, do I see you uh, nodding in agreement with what Cyrus is saying? Yes, absolutely. We, we know full well from a lot of uh, research that stress and uncertainty are very strong drivers of mental health. But I'm also thinking uh, that the relationship is a little bit more complex in the sense that we differentiate between physical stress uh, and psychological stress reactivity. And psychological stress reactivity, it's we sometimes talk about double arrow of pain, 
you know, the pain sensation, the physical pain sensation, and our psychological reaction to it, being pained by the pain. We can break down stress into those same aspects, you know, the physical aspect of physiological arousal, but also is this kind of psychological reactivity to being stressed, which tends to perpetuate our experience of stress. Well, we'll uh, talk about, if we can, uh, I mean, it sounds devastating to have that double whammy. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go along. But I promise to um, bring in Project Protect Mental Health, which you've been um, involved in since the lockdown began. T tell us what you've discovered. Yes. Well, just, just to, to lead up from what I was saying, the psychological stress reactivity uh, can be impacted by the practice which uh, my specialism is mindfulness meditation. And mindfulness allows us to change our relationship to what we experience. It uh, can help us to deal with our worries and our anxieties. Um, a lot of studies showed that it has positive effect on mental health. So our objective with this study was to see whether people who practice mindfulness meditation uh, and other practices that promote mindfulness as a, as a skill um, are bearing better during this time. It is, is mindfulness protective? And what we're finding that mindfulness is a personality predisposition, so we can be more or less neurotic um, as people, or we can be more or less mindful, meaning less reactive to things, less judgmental of things as likable, dislikable, um, having more resilience in the face of challenges. So mindfulness as a personality trait seems to be protective in, in the context of pandemic in terms of experience of loneliness, depression levels, anxiety levels, stress levels. But also if you then split our sample into those who meditate, or use mindfulness meditation and those that don't, uh, we also see gains, further gains in being better um, with handling so you can you can insulate yourself against the worst effects in your opinion if you adopt these practices we'll talk more about that later on in the program if we may cyrus you were again i think perhaps nodding in agreement with some of eleanor's points but i want to bring in something here from the world health organization to talk about how you can perhaps inure yourself uh, surround yourself by some kind of protection who says Minimize watching, reading, or listening to news about COVID-19 that causes you to feel anxious or distressed. The sudden and near constant stream of news reports about an outbreak can cause anyone to feel uncomfortable. And my point is, it's pretty much impossible to do that in this day and age. Yeah. So one advice I gave my patients, and I still give them, is to restrict access and restrict watching bad news. Uh, and... At the beginning of lockdown, we were con constantly bombarded with information regarding COVID-19 and regarding coronavirus. And uh, so some, of the, some of it was exaggerated, and you know, some of the information was, in fact, biased. And you, I, you, as, as a specialist, as a scientist, you, know, you kind of expect better from, from uh, news outlets in a way that they, they portrayed epidemiological and public health data. For example, one thing they did, they gave the public whole numbers. Now, statistically, whole numbers doesn't mean anything. The fact that 1,000 people die in Italy and 5,000, for example, in Spain doesn't mean anything unless you look at the data, look at the populations, and look at the, look at the underlying number of people that that kind of particular statistics takes into account. Do you think perhaps that by oversimplifying something that has a great deal of nuances in it, uh, the media perhaps made people's mental, mental state worse? Yeah. I mean, yes, I mean, you have to simplify information so people understand it. But if you over-simplify it, it could actually become skewed and it be could become false. Uh, and the focus at the beginning of the lockdown was this curve, this COVID-19 curve. Now, as a psychiatrist, and a lot of specialists were worried about the secondary manifestation, the secondary wave, the third wave, even the fourth wave, because associated with the lockdown. Uh, we were particularly worried about the mental health wave that we're seeing now. I mean, at the beginning of, of the lockdown, we were very quiet, nothing happened for a couple of weeks. But then we've had this deluge, this tsunami of mental health cases uh, that has come towards us, 
both through the through my, my NHS job and also, also pro privately. And all the time I'm getting contacted by patients who are very anxious. In fact, the term COVID anxiety is being used. These are people who are in a permanent fight or flight state. They cannot switch their brain off because they've been bombarded with information regarding COVID, regarding how to keep yeah. safe, wearing a mask, wash, washing their hands, staying at home. Uh, and yeah, so the, we're now seeing the secondary and, and, and third and fourth wave uh, of the... the, the so pandemic. really hard to switch off, Eleanor, other than mindfulness, in, in your study of the human psyche, what can you suggest as mitigation? Um, well, we found the relationship, positive relationship between recognizing some positive aspects of what is going on and sort of being grateful for, for those aspects. Uh, the kind of questions we ask in this survey um, are um, uh, reduction in pollution, um, opportunity to spend more time with the family, opportunity to engage more with your hobbies, to learn a new hobby, opportunity to do more volunteering work. Those people who responded positively to these items, they also experienced higher levels of mental health less loneliness, and generally worried less about the uh, things that um, uh, Sirius has um, rightly singled out as those that can drive our mental Although health. Although I, no I notice that you do say that some people, presumably out of this group, were embarrassed to admit that they're having what you described as the best time of their lives. Well, it, yes, actually, the, the reason why we started this study is that I was getting a lot of uh, emails and other comments through Facebook from fellow meditators saying, you know, secretly, it's been the best time of my life. You know, and, uh, for meditate, you know, one person's lockdown is another person's retreat. So having more time to practice, having more time to be in this space um, um, of, you know, practicing what we call mindful awareness, it's been incredibly nourishing for this population. And actually, when we look at our data, um, there is no systematic differences between uh, groups of meditators and non-meditators in terms of loss of job, loss of household income. So people were affected equally in negative and mm. positive ways. But in terms of how this practice is supportive and this triangulation between being uh, more grateful, being more mindful, also leads to less worry about the overall impact of pandemic on our physical, mental health and economic situation, but also um, general health market, general mental health markets. I can, I stop, can I stop you there and go to Cyrus again? I'll, I'll ask you about your thumbs up to something Eleanor was saying um, in, in just a moment, but let's refer to something she's just brought up, that you can look on the bright side if you can look on the bright side. Is it down to what sort of person you are by nature, whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, how you react to situations such as this with regards to your mental stability? So there, there, there is opportunity within disaster and within chaos. Uh, and, and some people have done pretty well uh, in the lockdown. Uh, now, those of us who have worked remotely before and can work remotely have carried on as normal. Now, as a psychiatrist, I'm in a privileged place because uh, I actually I set up a telepsychiatry service. I do a lot of remote consultations. And because that kind of physical examination and physical sort of hands-on intervention isn't really required in psychiatry, a lot of what we do face-to-face, -face, we can do remotely as well. However, my colleagues, my friends who've been plastic surgeons, dentists, uh, orthopedic surgeons, ophthalmologists, you know, a lot of them are sitting at home, but they were sitting at home, they were doing very little. And the ones that were self-employed, they were really worried about their future. Now, I heard that in, in, in one week, three dentists killed themselves in, in London because they're so worried about their future, they were self-employed, and the patients were not coming, and they were not allowed to see patients. But can, can I, I, I'd like to look at myself as a glass half full person. So what drives you to that point of desperation over something that you are pretty sure is going to pass at some point, and to which, to some extent, you can protect yourself against? What is it you, that you as a psychiatrist see in that person? So again, resilience is something that is inherent in, in us, in, in most of us, and it's something that needs to also come out uh, through, through sort of uh, well-being measures and mindfulness and some of the stuff that we, we, we just heard. 
Uh, and so the first thing I tell my patient is to focus on well-being. Yeah, switch off the news. Uh, do meditate. Do mindfulness. Go out for an exercise. It's so important. One of the things, one of the ways I kept staying, I went for a run every day for 30 minutes. So I did a 5K run every day just to get the blood flowing, get the circulation, get the blood flow to my brain. And that kind of physical activity is so important. It can combat depression. It can combat anxiety. A healthy diet is really important. Not self-medicating with alcohol is so important. Just reduce your alcohol intake. That's one advice I give my patients. Don't turn to illegal drugs as a form of medicating yourself for the distress, for anxiety, for the loneliness, for the insecurity. Don't smoke tobacco. So these are well-being measures. Uh, it, it's, it's so important and a professional as professionals we should all tell our patients initially to focus on well-being mm. i'm going to bring in the um, nhs guidance i had the who one earlier but it's, it's just quite uh, pertinent since you mentioned the dentists and finances um nhs guide national health service uk you may feel worried or anxious about your finances your health or those close to you perhaps you feel bored frustrated or lonely it's important to remember that it's okay to feel this way and that everyone reacts differently eleanor this was the point the last few words there everyone reacts differently you mustn't think you are the odd one out absolutely and you know the main principle of mindfulness is to accept all your experiences and what, what cyrus was saying is very important in the way that we don't feel anyone feel that in some way they're failing if they're not being resilient in the face of this challenge uh, the first way, uh, the, the, the first step is to accept how you really feel in the present moment, uh, whether you're worried or anxious, and then you walk from there. Um, and there, there is this concept of post-traumatic post growth, which is somewhat different from resilience. So the concept of resilience captures the characteristic of a person who just doesn't get perturbed much by, let's say, negative challenging events in their life. Whereas post-traumatic growth is a phenomenon where people see positive changes to their personality, positive changes to how they're able to cope with life and find, finding some kind of new meaning and changing a worldview in the face of very traumatic events. I'm going to go to Cyrus. I want to go back to something you said earlier in the program about the end of the first wave and how we have this curve. And you now believe that there's a second wave, perhaps, of psychiatric disorders. My question is, if people are concerned about that, and you are as well, but if patients are concerned about that, would they not then be worried about a third wave, a fourth wave, a fifth wave, that this might never end? Yeah, it, it will end. Uh, it, it will definitely end. Uh, history tells us of, of previous pandemics that they eventually come to an end. Uh, now, we, again, I'm not an epidemiologist, but it seems that there's going to be a second uh, COVID-19 wave, certainly in the UK. And we've already heard that many countries uh, in, in Europe, in the Far East, are actually going back into lockdown uh, as a result. Uh, and again, that is likely to be associated with uh, sort of like mental health manifestations. Uh, which I mentioned in terms of depression, anxiety. How, how do you stop it then becoming long-term damage with regard to your mental health? Well-being is so important. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and people think, you know, the first thing I do, I prescribe medication. Well, I don't. Uh, I just, you know, I, I talk to my patients and I, I, I learn about the lifestyle. And a lot of my patients' lifestyle is really unhealthy. They, they work 12 to 14 hours a day, for example. They do very little exercise. They eat really poorly. Uh, they, have, they, they, they put themselves in really stressful situations. So I tell them to take time off, to go on holiday, to try and sleep better, to moderate alcohol intake, not to take drugs, not to smoke. But, but, but seriously, if you tell somebody to try and sleep better, that isn't going to help if they're sleeping badly. Yeah. So, yeah, in, as a short-term intervention, I would prescribe a medication to help regulate their sleeping pattern. So I certainly would do that. Uh, and then we would offer them some therapy, some CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And if that doesn't work, then, yes, there's a role for medication, yeah. for antidepressants, for mood stabilizers, even antipsychotics. I'm wondering about long-term scar tissue from all of this. This is for both of you. Cyrus, you, you first. Long-term 
issues that people are going to have to deal with. scar tissue, yes. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder it is one condition that it is a long, it's a more sort of intermediate term, I would say, sort of the, the traumatic experiences that patients experience now uh, in three, six, 12 months will return as post-traumatic stress disorder. A chronic anxiety, chronic depression. And one worry I have is that the triggers that we've had in, in recent months would lead to chronic longer term manifestations. Yeah, triggers, Elena. Um, the, the kind of things that uh, Sari spoke about are very important. We've seen that in our data as well, that there is a relationship between uh, physical exercise, sleep, and better mental health. And another one I would like to, to add is um, nature, spending time in nature seems to be very protective. So there, there are going to be multiple triggers and, you know, we're going to get Brexit on top of COVID and our economic stability and economic outlook, uh, long term outlook is going to, to be even more worrisome. Um, so the triggers are not going to disappear and their nature might change. Um, so my, my personal <laughs> interest, both professionally and um, uh, in terms of my personal development, is how do we change relationship to things? We can't always control what happens to us. How can we change uh, how we react and respond to things? And th that's where mindfulness comes in. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm wondering, as we come towards the end of the program, whether this is entirely COVID-related. Um, or would it have happened anyway, an increase in problems with mental health because of the type of world in which we live, where we're exposed to bad news, fake news, all kinds of stresses. Is COVID to blame for this, or is it just the way we run our lives right now? Helena? Well, before COVID, we, we had uh, mounting concerns about the environment, which are not going to go away. Uh, there's also linked to increases in mental health. But also, as you pointed out, we have been seeing increases in, in mental health problems in our in industrialized world since uh, mid 20th century. Um, so the nature of triggers, as I said, will be changing uh, and always changing. But yes, of course, COVID-19 pandemic was a great shakeup um, and that's overlaid itself over multiple other problems that we were already facing. I wonder, Cyrus, whether we're looking at the past through rose-tinted spectacles, that we say today we live in a world where things are much more likely to adversely affect us. Whereas if you went back to the Middle Ages or the 19th century, people had other worries which were just as important to them, and it's just a matter of human nature to be concerned about your future. I mean, it is human nature, it is human psychology. Uh, right now, certainly in the West, we're in a very, very, very strong position uh, economically, uh, even though there's going to be a downturn, perhaps depression. Uh, again, we, we, you know, no, no one's starving at the moment. Still, there, there's adequate resources, there's, there's clean food, there's sanitation, there's, you know, running water. I mean, if you go back to Middle Ages, uh, so some of the estimates suggest two-thirds of the population in Europe died uh, because of the plague. And now, at most, we will lose 1% of our population uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, and, yeah, I, I do think that we have really high expectations now. And the human mind is such that we need to worry about something. I think from an evolutionary perspective, it is protective because you worry about something and you prepare for it. Yeah. But, but I, we, Sorry, I, I do suppose that the one thing that you can't say, Cyrus, or, or, or you wouldn't dare of saying to anybody you are lecturing, Eleanor, is get over it. For goodness sake, you've never had it so good. Um, I, I wouldn't say get over it uh, because, again, you know, I'm, I'm very much for people being honest with what they right. are. Right, be realistic, because Cyrus is saying, you know, we live in a much safer, less anxiety-prone world, we should at least, than we, than we have ever done through history. But but it's, yes, so it's, it's about, I'm echoing there, in terms of we have to be wise and discerning to always see both sides of the coin. 
Um, and, and that there is always every challenge is an opportunity as well. And we shouldn't lose sight of that, both collectively and individually. And Cyrus, were you sort of nodding or sorry, shaking your head because you disagree with my surmise there? No, no, I don't disagree with anything that Helena said. But I was saying perhaps we should be thankful for where we live, even though they are stressful times. Yes, we, we should be thankful, uh, definitely. Uh, but we have to bear in mind that some people genuinely suffer and are generally affected uh, by, by what's happening around them. Uh, and through, through, I mean, there, there are types of therapy that they, they can orientate patients and in terms of cognitive therapy and behavior therapy to, to make them uh, less anxious and better appreciate what they have rather than focusing on, on what they haven't got. I thank you both very, very much indeed. If you can always look on the bright side, I suppose, but in these times, as we know, it, it, it is very difficult. I appreciate you taking the time to come on this round table. Appreciate you taking the time to watch it wherever you happen to be doing so. You can catch up with our other programs on our YouTube channel. That's Round Table TRT World YouTube. From me, David Foster, for now, goodbye. <laughs>